Have mercy on me, O God, according to your steadfast love. According to your abundant mercy, blot out my transgressions. Wash me thoroughly from my iniquity and cleanse me from my sin. For I know my transgressions and my sin is ever before me. Indeed, I was born guilty, a sinner when my mother conceived me. Purge me with hyssop, and I shall be clean. Wash me, and I shall be whiter than snow. Hide your face from my sins, and blot out all my iniquities. Do not cast me away from your presence, and do not take your Holy Spirit from me. Then I will teach transgressors your ways, and sinners will return to you. O Lord, open my lips, and my mouth will declare your praise. The sacrifice acceptable to God is a broken spirit, a broken and contrite heart. O God, you will not despise. Friends in Christ, today with the whole church, we enter the time of remembering Jesus' Passover from death to life, and our life in Christ is renewed. We begin this holy season by acknowledging our need for repentance and for God's mercy. We are created to experience joy and communion with God, to love one another, and to live in harmony with creation. But our sinful rebellion separates us from God, our neighbors, and creation, so that we do not enjoy the life as our Creator intended. As disciples of Jesus, we are called to a discipline that contends against evil and resists whatever leads us from God's love and the love of neighbor. I invite you, therefore, to the discipline of Lent, self-examination and repentance, prayer and fasting, sacrificial giving and works of love, strengthened by the gifts of word and sacrament. Let us continue our journey through these 40 days to the great three days of Jesus' death and resurrection. Come, let us acknowledge our sin and seek God's forgiveness that we may live. Holy God, we confess that we have turned away from you and from our neighbors and in toward ourselves. We have hungered for security and possessions and power, and we are still empty. We have trusted ourselves and failed to trust in you. Lord, turn us back to you. In your mercy, forgive our sin and cleanse us from guilt and shame. Feed and fill us with the gift of life we find in your Son, Jesus Christ, our Lord. Amen. Here for yourselves, there is no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus. 
And the waters of baptism, grace abounds for you and for all. God turns to you in love and puts away every sin, every wrong turn for the sake of Jesus, the one God sent to save the world. Let us pray. Gracious God, out of your love and mercy, you breathed into dust the breath of life, creating us to serve you and our neighbors. Bring forth our prayers and acts of kindness. Bring about our hunger for justice and peace. And strengthen us to face our mortality with confidence in the mercy of your Son, Jesus Christ, our Savior and Lord. Amen. You may be seated. A reading from 2 Corinthians. We entreat you on behalf of Christ, be reconciled to God. For our sake he made him to be sin who knew no sin, so that in him we might become the righteousness of God. As we work together with him, we urge you also not to accept the grace of God in vain. For he says, at an acceptable time I have listened to you, and on a day of salvation I have helped you. See now is the acceptable time, see now is the day of salvation. We are putting no obstacle in anyone's way, so that no fault may be found with our ministry. But as servants of God, we have commended ourselves in every way, through great endurance, in afflictions, hardships, calamities, beatings, imprisonments, riots, labors, sleepless nights, hunger, by purity, knowledge, patience, kindness, holiness of spirit, genuine love, truthful speech, and the power of God, with the weapons of righteousness for the right hand and for the left, in honor and dishonor, in ill repute and good repute. We are treated as impostors and yet are true, as unknown and yet are well known, as dying and see we are alive, as punished and yet not killed, as sorrowful yet always rejoicing, as poor yet making many rich, as having nothing and yet possessing everything. Word of God, word of life. The Holy Gospel according to St. Matthew in the sixth chapter. Jesus said, Beware of practicing your piety before others in order to be seen by them. For then you have no reward from your Father in heaven. So whenever you give alms, do not sound a trumpet before you as the hypocrites do in the synagogues and in the streets, so that they may be praised by others. Truly, I tell you, they have received their reward. But when you give alms, do not let your left hand know what your right hand is doing, so that your alms may be done in secret, and your Father who sees in secret will reward you. And whenever you pray, do not be like the hypocrites, for they love to stand and pray in the synagogues and at the street corners, so that they may be seen by others. Truly, I tell you, they have received their reward. But whenever you pray, go into your room and shut the door. And pray to your Father who is in secret, and your Father who sees in secret will reward you. And whenever you fast, do not look dismal like the hypocrites, for they disfigure their faces so as to show others that they are fasting. Truly, I tell you, they have received their reward. But when you fast, put oil on your head and wash your face, so that your fasting may be seen not by others, but by your Father who is in secret. And your Father who sees in secret will reward you. 
Do not store up for yourselves treasures on earth where moth and rust consume and where thieves break in and steal, but store up for yourselves treasures in heaven where neither moth nor rust consumes and where thieves do not break in and steal. For where your treasure is, there your heart will be also. The Gospel of our Lord. So I heard a story a few years back about a dad who was teaching his children all about Lent and what it was about, and he said that it was about discipline and uh, trying to focus more on God and do things to connect more closely with God. And so he said to his children, oftentimes people give up something for Lent, a sacrifice of something they really like to do uh, so that they can remember that God is more important than that thing. So he encourages kids to try to think up something they wanted to give up. And after a moment's thought, his son said, Dad, I think I'm going to give up kicking people. <laughs> to this his dad said, well, son, this is supposed to be you giving up something that you really enjoy doing. And his son said, of course, Dad, I enjoy kicking people. <laughs> Lent is really a downer of a season, isn't it? People giving up things they really like, and for what? There's all these do's and do nots in our gospel story tonight. It's as if we have to deprive ourselves of things we really enjoy doing and feel bad about ourselves so that we can feel really good about Easter when it comes. I often imagine that people outside the church probably view this season as the church's way of kind of sucking the life out of life. In fact, here on Ash Wednesday, we gather at the beginning of this season to focus a great deal on death. Most of you will come to this altar and receive ashes on your forehead, a reminder of your own mortality. Remember, you are dust, and to dust you shall return. Not exactly the most feel-good of rituals, is it? There isn't a Hallmark card made out for this holiday. Remember, you're going to die. Have a nice day. Sometimes I wonder why we go through all these rituals and this tradition year after year. But every time I come to Ash Wednesday in the season of Lent, the answer always comes up the same. It's because I need it. I need to be reminded that each of us only has so much time on this earth, and we better not waste it. I need to be reminded of the God who wants to bring death to all the little deaths in my life, the things that are leading me away from God. I need to be reminded to pause for a minute and consider the ways I'm not doing what matters to me and to God, and to try at least for a season to focus on those things that really do matter. But more than all that, I need to be reminded that in all of life's ups and downs, in all of life's little deaths, and the ashes of our lives, God is there. We have a God who is there, breathing life into creation. We have God who breathed life into each of us when we were born. We have a God who breathes life into us today. We have a God who will breathe life into the ashes of our death. We're so good at avoiding death in our culture. We'd rather pretend it's not there, or at least something that we shouldn't talk about. It's not polite to talk about that, but it's always there lurking around the corner. As a pastor, I see a lot more death than the average person, and I know how painful it can be. But it's actually in the ashes and the dust, those intersections where life and death meet, that we mysteriously connect most deeply with God. I had an experience of that this last summer, I got one of those phone calls as a pastor you hope not to get. It was the news that a young couple had an unexpected early birth. The baby was born three and a half months premature. You might remember us praying for that baby here at church. I was the one closest to the hospital in Minneapolis, so I was called upon to go. The couple wasn't sure if their little baby was going to make it. And since I was close by, they wondered if I could come and baptize that child. To say I was nervous and unprepared is an understatement. I happened to be on vacation at the time and all I had packed were some cargo shorts and t-shirts. And the whole walk from the parking garage with my uh, animal from Sesame Street t-shirt on and my cargo shorts, 
I was feeling very inadequate, and as I got on the elevator, I left feeling stupid and unsure what I was going to say, feeling totally inadequate to be in that room. What do you say in a room that's supposed to be filled with life, but a room where it feels like death is lurking just around the corner? I certainly couldn't promise the couple that everything was going to be okay. What was I to say? I came into the room and saw this tiny little baby, just one pound, one ounce, about the size of my hand in an incubator, a life hanging in the balance. And it was there in that intersection between life and death that God's promise became real. It was there I felt God's promise come so close the promise of baptism that Christ didn't come just to meet us in our life, but Christ meets us in our death. And that whether we live or whether we die, we are the Lord's. It was there when I was feeling inadequate to the task that I found the words to say, words I'd said many times at funerals before, but that felt so fitting right there in that room. I am convinced that neither death nor life or anything else in all of creation will be able to separate us from the love of God and Christ Jesus our Lord. These were words I not only needed to say, but words I needed to hear. In that room, in that holy place between life and death, I felt God's presence in a remarkable way. I took a little eyedropper and I sprinkled a little drop of water on a tiny forehead and I said the promise of baptism Haley, I baptize you in the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit. Nothing can take that away. It was indeed a holy moment where I was reminded that we are not alone wherever we find ourselves. It wasn't just me and that anxious couple and their sweet little baby in that room, but Christ was there holding us all in his tender care. Just yesterday, I got to hold that little baby Haley again. And she's now 15 pounds and cute as can be. And yesterday I was reminded again that all of life is a holy space. And whatever comes our way in life or in death, God is there. Nadia Boltzweber shares her own experience of finding God in one of those intersections between life and death. One day she was doing a funeral on a Tuesday for a young man who had completed suicide preaching words, trying to find words of comfort to a mother who had lost her child. And the next day on Ash Wednesday, she was at the bedside of another child who had been born into the world. Here I was on Ash Wednesday, she writes, standing in a birthing room at the University of Colorado Hospital on the day that the church remembers that we are but dust and to dust we shall return. With one hand, I held a small metal pot of ashes, and with the other, I reached across to the mother Duffy's bed and made the sign of the cross in black ashes on her forehead, and then on her partner. Duffy had that beautiful and totally exhausted look of a woman who had just given birth, and Charlie had that proud and totally exhausted look of a partner who had just spent hours feeling helpless. The baby, too, I asked her parents. Duffy and Charlie immediately said, yes, please, the baby too. My voice strained a bit, she writes, as I pressed ever so gently into the brow of baby Willa's brand new skin, flesh that had been exposed to air for only a few precious hours. I couldn't completely constrain the trembling in my voice as I reminded all of us in the room that she, even she, full of beauty and hope, and just hours from her mother's womb, will at her death return to dust, and the very heart of God. And at these words, the mother mouth, thank you. And then I knew, I knew more than on any other Ash Wednesday that the promises of baptisms and funerals, the promises of birth and death are inextricably wrapped up together. For we come from God and to God we shall go. There's so much that gets in the way of us experiencing that truth. You and I don't know how much time we have on this earth. We don't know how great the distance between our life and our death will be. But on this day, the distance between our birth and our death is closed 
And we hear the promise that wherever we find ourselves, we are in God's hands. And nothing, no sin, no darkness, yes, no death is there, that God can't come there and breathe us back to life. Today, may you hear Christ's word that is for you, a reminder that God breathes life into the dust and ashes of our lives. This is a word that was there with you in your birth. It is a word that is with you today and a word that will certainly be with you in your death. Here Christ says to you once again, do not be afraid. I have called you by name. I love you and you are mine. Let us pray. God, we pray on this night on which you call us to repent from our broken ways. You call us to prayer. And so we meet you in this space, asking that your Holy Spirit would guide our prayers, would guide our hearts, minds, and actions on this night and throughout this sacred season. Holy God, teach us, your church, to be honest about our sinfulness, honest about our mortality honest about who we are. Remind us that you meet all our limitations with abundance, 
for you have more than enough grace to cover our sin, more than enough life to cover our death. Lord, you call us to your table and you fill our bodies with your spirit of justice and mercy. Strengthen us for the work that lies ahead, work that you ask of us to feed and free your people. God, on this penitential night, we seek grace, we seek mercy, we seek your love. Soothe our souls, wash away the things that keep us far from you, and restore joy in our lives. We ask this in the name of Jesus, who became dust to show us the way to eternal life. Amen. Peace of the Lord be with you always. Please share a sign of Christ's peace. Let us pray. Merciful God, receive the sacrifice of our praise and thanksgiving and the offering of our lives, that following in the way of the cross, we may know the joy of resurrection through Christ our Lord. Amen. Tonight we receive ashes on our foreheads that remind us God created us out of the dust of the earth. May they be a sign of your mortality and a sign of your regret for your sin. May the sign of the cross 
made with these ashes remind you that by the cross of Christ, you are given eternal life. In the night in which he was betrayed, our Lord Jesus took bread and gave thanks, broke it and gave it to his disciples, saying, Take and eat. This is my body given for you. Do this for the remembrance of me. Again, after supper, he took the cup, gave thanks, and gave it for all to drink, saying, This cup is the new covenant in my blood, shed for you and for all people for the forgiveness of sin. Do this for the remembrance of me. Lord, remember us in your kingdom and teach us to pray. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever and ever. Amen. Return to God with all your heart. Receive bread for the journey. Drink for the desert.
body and blood of our Lord Jesus Christ strengthen you and keep you in God's grace. Let us pray. Compassionate God, you have fed us with the bread of heaven. Sustain us in our Lenten pilgrimage. May our fasting be hunger for justice, our alms a making of peace, and our prayer the song of grateful hearts through Christ our Lord. Amen. May God, who has called us forth from the dust of the earth and claimed us as children of the light, strengthen you on your journey into life renewed. The Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord's face shine on upon you with grace and mercy. The Lord look upon you with favor and give you peace. Amen. with the cross of Christ, go forth to love and serve the Lord. Thanks. Thanks. Thanks.